Greetings. We're broadcasting live for the Nonprofit Chat. You're listening to this on the podcast, the Nonprofit Exchange, or you might be watching us on Facebook Live. Anyway, Russell Dennis and Hugh Ballou are back. And as normal, we're interviewing someone that has really good content. And tonight our guest is Doug Brown. And Doug is an expert in a number of areas. I've known him for a few years. And every time that I have a conversation with him, I learn a lot of stuff. So this, I want you to take notes. We're going to give you a link. There'll be some infographics, infographics. There'll be some other things that you'll be able to take advantage of. So go to nonprofitchat.org if you want to see the video and see some of the notes and the transcript for some of the key talking points from tonight's interview. Doug Brown, welcome to the Tuesday Nonprofit Chat. Uh, thanks, you and Dennis. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Tell us a little bit about you. You, you, um, you run Newswire, and you have this, this really secret power with LinkedIn, this special power. So talk about Doug Brown. Give us a little sense of who you are and what your skills are. Well, I've been in internet marketing uh, really since there's been internet. Our, our first project was in, in 1995, and uh, really that's about the start of internet marketing. So uh, I've been around the internet and been trying to figure out how to capitalize on the resources there, you know, for a long time now. I hate to date myself, but uh, I wasn't really young when I started doing that either. But uh, at any rate, in uh, 2003, we started a, a company called, uh, I was involved when it started, of Newswire Network. And Newswire is a press release distribution platform. It goes to Google News and it goes, it syndicates press releases on behalf of other people, uh, you know, kind of across the web and, and in the real world also. And, um, you know, press, uh, Newswire has been a fairly successful company. It's, it's been around for a long time, but we really experienced some kind of meteoric growth in the last five years. And almost all of that is attributable to what we did in LinkedIn. And uh, so you, you and I have been talking about that a little bit, and I appreciate the chance to, to come on and share kind of what we've learned about uh, LinkedIn and about connecting and about social marketing. And uh, I think all those things are applicable to anyone that's trying to form relationships and uh, monetize their relationships, whether it's in a for-profit setting, a non-profit setting, or really just about anything else. So, you know, that's kind of my background. I've been in, in journalism and, and, uh, and Newswire almost exclusively for the last uh, 13 years. Uh, but like I say, you know, part of running any business is finding people to uh, pay you to use your service. And uh, like I say, I think we, we figured something out about LinkedIn that may not be totally unique. I'm sure there's other people that have figured out similar kind of ways to utilize the platform. But uh, maybe what is unique is I'm willing to sit here and tell you about it. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> we, I see a lot of people on all social media, and LinkedIn is no exception. It is social, and social means relationship. And I get tired of people just hammering me with stuff. And what you bring to, to the expertise that you bring to clients is how to build relationships and how to build your, your sphere of influence. Um, because in charities, we, we want to have donors, we want to have board members, we want to have volunteers, we want to have stakeholders that are participating. And that ain't going to happen if we haven't built a relationship and understand what their passion is. And Russell has spoken about that in, in previous sessions about how do we uh, connect with the passion of the people who really could serve us really well. Let me... We're going to talk primarily about LinkedIn tonight, but I yeah, want to let, let me just pick up on that and, and uh, emphasize that that is exactly true. You know, when we started really seeing some growth in our business was when we decided that we were going to form relationships with people uh, rather than just trying to present them with an offer. And uh, that's what social networking and specifically LinkedIn is great for. And we'll talk about some of the differences between LinkedIn and, and other social networks and that kind of thing. But it, it, it really is social first and you have to remember that. It is. And there's so many people that don't understand that. And we actually repel the people that we're trying to attract 
before we um, get into this LinkedIn, I've got some questions for you. And we've posted questions live on uh, Facebook and Twitter with the hashtag nonprofit chat. So if, you, if you're so inclined, do answer those questions with a hashtag nonprofit chat so we can find the thread. And if it's question one, answer with A1. Here's, here's an answer to that. Um, so Doug, let's, let me touch on Newswire a minute before we go to LinkedIn. Newswire.net is the site. And what problem are you solving for people with Newswire.net? Well, Newswire is a, is a way to communicate um, your events, basically, your news in your words uh, to the media. So, uh, or I guess even more specifically to your target audience. Um, you know, there's been a real change in the way that media is consumed and distributed. Um, you know, like a lot of people listening, I think I used to read two or three or four newspapers a day. And um, gee, reading three newspapers a day right now takes about 15 minutes because my, my local paper went from hundreds of pages down to maybe tens or fives of pages. Wow. Anyway, uh, you know, just uh, news is different than it used to be. And, um, even Google News has changed a lot in the uh, in the 10 years or 12 years that it's been out there. It used to be kind of an idea that a press release was something that was prepared and sent out to the local newspaper, the local TV station, the local whatever, with the idea that it was going to be republished in the local paper. And uh, you know, in 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 a really few number of years, that's really changed just because there's almost nobody home at the local newspaper. So nowadays, people consume their news online. And uh, that's one of the great things about Newswire and about Google News specifically is uh, Newswire is, uh, you know, specializes in putting its, you know, the news of our subscribers out into Google News and places where they can communicate their story directly uh, to consumers without uh, having to hope and pray that somebody at the local paper picks it up and, and republishes it. So uh, we're just a publication service. We, we're a way for people to disseminate uh, the news about their organizations out to the public directly. And I would encourage people to look at it because it's very, very cost effective and yes. your reach is enormous. It shows up and you can audit where it shows up online. You give the URL so people can see all the places it's been published. Yeah, we give, uh, and, and you know, uh, through the last 15 years, Newswire has, has kind of created its own, uh, you know, its own weather system, so to speak. We have over 100,000 page views a day on Newswire, and a, a typical release will get uh, a thousand or more views right on our site, in addition to what it gets elsewhere. So uh, a lot of those views on our sites come from Google News, so we, we, we're all indexed in Google News, and people that are searching for whatever keywords you happen to use, find it, come to our site and uh, read the, read the post. And then we, we try to design our cell, our site in such a way that it's sticky. So people uh, can see related stories. So they may come to see someone else's story and, and browse around and hit yours. So uh, people read on an average about four stories. They go to four different pages on Newswire every time they visit. So, you know, it's, it's a great way to get your information out there. And like you said, it's very cost effective. 100,000 views a day. A day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you just kind of slipped that in there. I'm going to catch you on that one. All right. So newswire.net, we'll put that link in the notes for today. Um, so I've experienced your work with LinkedIn to be a, a refreshing change with some of these, these tools that people are using that just says, hi, I'm so-and-so. I got this. How about let's have a conversation because I want to sell you something. So Let's, let me ask you the same question with LinkedIn. Um, this, this whole thing is creating your position of influence and connecting with people that matter. And I, I kind of reframed the stuff that you sent to me because that's what we are, we're doing with charities is we don't know how to get out, out of our own way and to tell our message. So LinkedIn, uh, there's lots of nonprofit leaders. There's lots of business leaders. That's a really good platform. So, let me ask you first, what problem that you're solving with LinkedIn for people? And then we're going to go to why is it different? So tell us what problem you're solving for, for people with LinkedIn. Well, with LinkedIn, um, what we, what we try and do for, for people. And by the way, so I guess the, the rest of the resume, the thing that I didn't really continue on was, uh, 
uh, you know, we were so successful in building some tools and some and some ways to do things uh, for LinkedIn that we've actually taken a few clients that we we kind of do that process for. So, and you know, a couple of the people that I've I've done that for and that kind of thing. So, uh, so just to continue on there, the problem that we solve. Uh, through LinkedIn is we just help people make the right kinds of connections. We help them connect with their target audience and we, we sometimes call it your ideal or your perfect customer. We help them identify that perfect customer and uh, create a relationship with that person that over time can be turned into, uh, you know, a business relationship of some sort or another. And like you say, uh, that could be inviting someone to participate in a board or an event or just identifying and, and creating a conversation with someone that, that you may otherwise not have had an opportunity to, you know, to get in touch with. Maybe they run in a different circle or live in a different city or a different state or a different country for heaven's sakes. Uh, you know, there's a half a billion people almost on LinkedIn nowadays. And it's a, it's a very different kind of place than uh, the other social networks. So, you know, you have big numbers on, on Facebook that are, you know, that LinkedIn will never match. But the difference is LinkedIn is all about business and it's for business. And uh, let me just throw a couple of the statistics out, you know, just kind of off the top of the head statistics. But the people that live in the United States, this isn't worldwide, but just in the United States that are LinkedIn members have an average income of $110,000. Oh, my word. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Uh, you know, it, it's not a bunch of teenagers you know, it's not people sharing kitty pictures. It's there about business and people are there to do business and to connect for business. Now, the, you ask the problem that we solve and, and kind of the mindset without getting in too far ahead of ourselves here. You know, I, I'd almost venture to say that 90 some odd percent of the people that might be listening to this, if you go back and look at your LinkedIn profile, it reads like a resume. And uh, Hugh, that might... Uh, and I might hit a little close to home. You and I worked on your resume. <laughs> Absolutely. Your, uh, your LinkedIn profile a little while ago. Yeah, that was a paradigm shift for me. But the, uh, you know, the first thing to recognize is that, you know, unless you are a job hunter, which, you know, I'm, that's a legitimate thing to do on LinkedIn is hunt for a job. But unless you're there to hunt for a job, your profile shouldn't look like a resume. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be a, a resume. It should be like every other landing page. And this is something I've been doing for 20 years now. Like every other thing you put on the internet, it ought to have benefits. <laughs> what do I get out of connecting with Hugh Ballou? What's in it for me? Everybody wants to know, you know, at the end of the day, what's in it for me? And uh, so that's really where we start with uh, all of the people that we deal with and, and where I'm going to start with our little uh, free session today is let's start with your profile and let's make sure that your profile is something that invites people to connect with you, the right kind of people. Uh, and, you know, telling people that you're the CEO or the executive director gives them no reason to want to connect with you. If, if you tell them what you can do for them or what you do for others, now you're starting down the right track. So we, we can talk about some more specifics with that. But I guess that's the first problem we solve is, is trying to get people uh, to use LinkedIn correctly and not as a, uh, a spot to host their resumes. Well, that's a paradigm shifter right there. Now, we, this brought up a, a potential conflict in my mind. I have a Hugh Ballou profile on LinkedIn, and I have a Center Vision Leadership Foundation, which is my charity. I have a page for that. Should I have a separate whole profile for Center Vision or it's, it's a different page underneath Hugh Ballou? Is that wrong? No, I think that's the right way to do it. So, so uh, you know, I, I would imagine that a lot of people on, on this call have connected with you on LinkedIn. And if they haven't, I invite them to, to connect with you and put out a, you know, go look at, go look at Hugh's uh, profile on LinkedIn and you'll get a good idea of where to start because we spent a little bit of time thinking about that and, and working a little bit on that. In fact, we have an infographic that we're going to share a little later on that will give you some of that same information. But it kind of starts with a, uh, you know, with your title. Uh, so, you know, if you just scroll through your friends on, on LinkedIn, you're going to see titles that say managing partner, accountant, uh, <laughs> business manager. 
you know, all those kind of things. Again, they're kind of resume kind of things. And again, those things just don't do anything for anyone unless they are looking to find a, an accountant. You better not have accountant in your profile, even if you are the world's greatest accountant. Uh, you know, it's, and even if you're an accountant, you, you know, and you were trying to make a profile, you probably should do something like, I help people save tax money, tax dollars. I help people pay the right amount of taxes. I help people, you know, give them a benefit. Don't just give them your resume. Tell them why you're worth connecting with. Why are you worth knowing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just looking. There's people um, commenting on Facebook about how good this is. Um, um, they're sharing the, the, the stuff. It's quite a list of people. Shannon Grunich, she was here a couple weeks ago talking about um, her, her piece on publicity. And you're going to be back with us uh, on this on the 25th of July. Yeah, I'm going to shift hats and put on the, the, the PR yeah. hat. <laughs> yeah. You're going to be back here with a, with a lot of really, really good folks. But I'm, I'm, so you helped me fine tune the Hugh Ballou piece. And, and so I'm thinking, okay, I haven't even thought about my, the piece for my nonprofit. So the whole, that would apply to that as well, wouldn't it? It, it kind of would. But I mean, the, the thing that you have to realize is that, uh, you know, even if you're General Motors, uh, your company page is not very well viewed on LinkedIn. I mean, people are on LinkedIn really to find out about other people and not to find out so much about their companies. So, you know, your company profile really, in my opinion, is better served through your web page and by linking from your profile to your web page. And if you do multiple things and link to multiple web pages. And, but I mean, the bottom line is still, Hugh Ballou is worth knowing because of the benefits that you can bring to people, uh, not because you went to, uh, MIT, I don't know where you went to college, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I mean, your, your resume and where you worked last year is not why they wanna know you. Uh, they wanna know you because of what they can learn from you or what they can get out of you. So that's what I think we focused on when we, we took a quick run through your uh, LinkedIn profile the other day. And uh, that's just kind of the way it is. That's, that's what, the, you know, what it's all about, um, is, is telling people, you know, that, that's what the profile is all about is letting them know the benefits, uh, not the features. You know, nobody wants to know the features. Nobody wants to know where you went to school, uh, you know, what your job title was at your last four jobs. You know, th those are features and, and they're important to you and they're probably important to your wife. So I'm not trying to, you know, take those things away from anybody. But uh, me, Doug Brown, if I want to connect with you, I want to know what I get out of it. You know, what's, what's in it for me? What are the what are the benefits, not the features? Where you went to school, your last three job titles doesn't really interest me in connecting with you. Well, and we had David Corbin uh, on Brand Slaughter uh, last month, and we had David Dunworth before that. And both of them talked about how each of us, well, we as leaders represent our brand. So if, right. if, if I'm the executive director or I'm the founder of, I'm the founder of Center Vision and President, Center Vision Leadership Foundation, I represent that brand to because we're the nurture organization for other charities. We help people build the skills, build a strategy, build a team and build their income. Um, and I find um, that there's a, so many people, I'm coming to Salt Lake City, I haven't quite put it together, but Russ has been a presenter at um, a couple of down in Florida and in Denver, uh, these one day, one day events that I do, leadership empowerment, and I find that leaders are overwhelmed. They got too much on their plate and they want to connect with other people, but they have tr trouble getting to events. The system that you've developed is really brilliant at helping people find the relationships with the people that have a similar passion or a similar interest, um, or there's a chance to collaborate, a chance to, to bring people together in a, in a reasonable conversation. Now, you pointed out that Facebook is the social stuff, the kitty pictures, the, the the family shots and all of that. And you got teeny teenagers and all kind of people. Twitter, which I like a lot. It's I have 200,000 people on Twitter and I have made some significant connections on Twitter, but it's a very distinctly different kind of niche. So LinkedIn, I've not mastered. So what make it you so if I'm hearing you right, it stands out because it's where business people do business. Is that That's exactly right. 
Okay. That's exactly right. So, I mean, everything has its own spot. We, I've got over a million followers on Twitter, but I use it really just to broadcast Newswire news. Okay. But I mean, there, there's no, you know, that's not the same as making connections with people. Right. So, I mean, it's, you know, I put out news, legit news through my Twitter feed. I don't use Facebook at all. Uh, and that's not to say there's not a spot for Facebook and lots of things, but there's not a, a spot for Facebook in what I think that I do. So that's okay. I mean, you, you know, with the, I'm not even going to kind of guess to know the numbers, but I understand Facebook is well over a billion nowadays. So that would say that probably a lot of the people that are on LinkedIn are also on Facebook. So I'm not, I'm not trying to draw that kind of a distinction and say that, you know, there's nobody there. There's no way to mm -hmm. make meaningful relationships. Obviously there is, but the, the distinction with LinkedIn is that people are there for business. If you, you know, if you start posting kitty pictures on LinkedIn, you know, you're going to never hear the end of it. I mean, it's just not, it's not why it's there. It's not what it's there for. Uh, it's there about business. It's there about being better at business, being a better business leader, finding, uh, resources uh, you know the the there's just some I could spew amazing statistics all day long but 72 percent of business to business purchases right now are preceded by a LinkedIn search so in other words if you're if you're buying a copier you're gonna go figure out who that is that you're buying a copier from or you're gonna go find the copier guy in your LinkedIn stuff so it, it really is about business. It's about business to business. Um, and I, I wouldn't take nonprofit out of that because that's still business to business at just a little different slant on it. But I mean, the principles are still exactly the same. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, so I wouldn't draw any distinction there. We've been preaching that, you know, it's a business. You have yeah. more rigid rules with IRS. But yeah. it, you know, we if you're not running like a business, you're not going to be around very much longer, right? Amen. Amen. Um, as a matter of fact, I had an interview just a little while ago with somebody up in Michigan and um, she had looked at my LinkedIn profile and I was thinking, fixed it before she looked at it. <laughs> so that was a good, um, let me, let me bring this. So, so just to bring that home for you, whether you know it or not, 72% of the people that are going to do business with you have looked at your LinkedIn profile. 72%. So, yeah. If I'm showing up, if somebody's going to donate to me in my charity, they're going to check me out. There's they're no question some... about it. Yeah. And, and and you hope they don't check you out on LinkedIn and find your kitty pictures, right? You, I mean, you want to be a serious person that has something serious to offer, whatever your your niche is. And, uh, and that's not the same as sharing your family uh, fun on, link, on, uh, on Facebook. I, again, I'm not here to bash facebook no. i know there's a, a spot for it but if people are going to do business with you 72 percent of the time they're going to proceed that with looking at your linkedin profile so it better be pretty good it's a different mindset and yeah it's, it, it's a whole different it, it feels a different purpose i mean to call them both social networks while it's true is misleading because they are as different as night and day Russell's agreeing with me there. Well, let's let's bring Russell in. He's 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 radically polite. He's uh, just out there and he's got good stuff to say. Russell David Dennis, uh, weigh in. You're very successful on LinkedIn. You write blog posts and you do all kind of stuff. So, what's your experience with with LinkedIn? Well, I, 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 I really sort of made a go at it because it was it was meant for business. So, I thought I should get serious with it, and I and I. Uh, I bought some additional services uh, with with the uh, with the profile so that I could contact more people. I just went north of 3,600 followers on LinkedIn. That's awesome. It changed the look and feel, but according to the old look there, it said I had what they called an all-star profile. Uh, well, that's pretty good, but I, I've connected. I've, I've had a lot of face-to-face -face meetings with people. Um, I, I've even been in touch with people I haven't talked to lately. So I just kind of dropped uh, dropped in here because I have a lot of people in here. And 
I wanted to see how many of them fell under nonprofit. And it's probably about a quarter of them that do. So that's awesome. Just over a quarter. And uh, I did a company page, but I, it didn't it didn't seem to have the look and feel I thought it would. It, it, it's not like your typical web page. But yeah, I've managed to use Facebook to create a page and create uh, some groups too. So I think. Uh, everything has its place and Twitter sort of drives traffic. But the place where the rubber meets the road as far as face-to-face, -face, it's been with LinkedIn. That's exactly my experience. Now Russell has, he takes the um, edited version of this video and he'll put it on his LinkedIn page. So Russell, there's people expecting that and you've got a following with these, these, uh, these uh, interviews. Give us a little highlight of, you know, what, what's that experience been like? Well, typically about 10% of my followers will watch an average post. Uh, and some of them are, most of them are first connections, but that, that's sort of typical. And it just depends. There have been some subjects, the subject on boards, when we had Dr. Tyan Gordon mm -hmm. on uh, boards are something that people are very interested in. Uh, that's, I've just had more, uh, those, those particular posts have had more traction. And uh, that was the one instance where the, a podcast uh, had more people go <laughs> left in the video. So, I, you know, I, I'm trying to look at putting uh, some of our podcasts out there. And, and uh, uh, I could probably go back and put some shows that we've had before because this content is evergreen. Uh, it is like podcast. They like being able to to grab a hold of those. They go to the page. They can download it. Uh, they can go see other podcasts. So that's a habit I think I'm going to get into. Is really uh, putting the podcast up so that people can have access to that while they're driving. I read a lot of audio books in the car. I, I learn a lot in my car because I spend a lot more time than I thought about it. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a great place to, I, you know, I'm kind of an NPR guy, but uh, podcasts yeah. and NPR and, you know, that's, yeah. that's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, Russ has been very, uh, so, so, so what about um, Russ, you publish articles. I want to have some dialogue with Doug about you. Uh, Doug, Russ is a very good writer and he writes some very relevant stuff and he, and he posted on uh, LinkedIn. He's also posted on the Center Vision blog and Doug, you're certainly invited to contribute to the magazine, uh, nonprofit performance magazine and uh, our blog role on our Center Vision leadership site. But um, Russ, you've, you've created some articles. What is, what do you think that does to help you connect with your tribe? Well, people get a sense of what I'm thinking, and more importantly, I, I get a sense of what sort of things people are concerned about uh, based on some of the response uh, to those articles. And, and uh, yeah, typically, I have, I have a response rate of anywhere from 3% to the, the, the article that I had that had the largest percentage of my followers. Uh, look at it, drew about 20%. And uh, I posted that, on, uh, and uh, I don't think I posted that on LinkedIn. It was on one of my other sites. Shared it to my LinkedIn, and the question was, who's responsible for fundraising? Mm -hmm. And I had quite a few views on that. So, And I, I talked about boards there. So there's a lot of interest around around that, and, and people really want to know how to go about getting better. People really want to know how to go about finding uh, board members who can really uh, add some juice to what they're doing, whether that's through skills or, or their networks. Or, and uh, the thing that LinkedIn has is you can talk about charitable opportunities and a little bit of what matters to you uh, in the platform. And, and, and uh, let people know that you're available to sit on boards and that type of thing. So it's a really good place to shop for board members. If you can take the time to, to reach out to a few people and, and see what's on their minds, you can 
find out a little bit about what resonates with them there. So I want you to think of a real hard question for our guest on, on LinkedIn. So I'm going to go back to him and let him weigh in on some of the stuff that you talked about. And then we'll come back and let you give him a zinger question. <laughs> uh, okay. I actually do have a couple of things that I'd like to uh, kind of weigh in there. So I do think that, uh, I do think it is important for you to continue to publish on, on LinkedIn, but don't make the mistake of thinking that's how you're creating contact. So your, your contact base will grow a little bit from, from those kind of things. But the, the truth is, and I'm going to probably say something that's a little unorthodox here. And that is we like to use LinkedIn for contacting and for identifying contacts. And then our goal is to take the conversation outside of LinkedIn. And I'll tell you why that is, um, you know, most people and probably including, including you guys and, and most people here looked at LinkedIn somewhat rarely. And maybe that's uh, once a day, once a week, once a month, uh, as opposed to your email that, you know, I, I get, I finally have my, my telephone set to not give me emails between midnight and 5 a.m. But I mean, other than that, you know, I'm basically 20 plus hours a day responding to email. So, and, and most business people are kind of like that. So one of our goals is to take uh, the contacts that we make on LinkedIn outside of LinkedIn. And um, I don't know if I, I think I, I just sent you something privately, Hugh, in the chat here. I don't know if, if you can post that to everybody, but, mm -hmm. but uh, I've got kind of a six step way that we follow and there's not any detail there but I mean the steps to making it work is is to work on your headline and work on your profile and then use LinkedIn to identify your perfect customer request contact with them to do one or two follow-up messages through LinkedIn and then to move the mess you know the 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 contact outside of LinkedIn and we have found that by far more effective so whether that's a phone call whether that's an email whether it's a text, however you normally communicate. I mean, if I were to ask you, Hugh, how often do you message with someone in LinkedIn? The answer is going to probably be seldom. <laughs> and, and everybody's the same thing. So, I mean, you're, you're using it, you know, what we found and, and what we recommend and those steps that I, I just gave are, you know, we use it to identify, we use it to connect, we use it to start a conversation, but as soon as possible, we get it outside of LinkedIn back into the way that people are used to communicating. Well, and it does bring it front and center. Um, but there are, and you've shown me ways to find people in a geographic area or a demographic or a psychographic, you know, you can sort people and Russ has far more advanced skills than I do. Um, so there's, uh, do you, so go to back to this, how often do I check it? Are you on LinkedIn every day? And if so, how much? Are you asking me? Yeah, I, but outside of the work you do for other people, just personally, how, how, how long do you work it every day or do you work it every day? Well, I, you know, I, the answer is we do this for our salespeople. So it's a great question to ask me because I don't get in there as a consumer, but maybe once a week. And I think I'm fairly typical. You know, I mean, part of what we do with LinkedIn, you know, involves some of our staff all day, every day. But that's kind of different in terms of, of me checking up on my friends and seeing, you know, randomly reading posts and, you know, reading what some of my friends have posted, you know, not a lot. Um, some, but not a lot. Uh, and, and in that respect, I think it's very different than Facebook. I mean, I've got, you know, I won't name names, but, uh, you know, I've got uh, kids, <laughs> adult kids that spend, uh, you know, way too much of their life, in my opinion, uh, on LinkedIn or on, on Facebook. People don't do that really on LinkedIn. I mean, it's not, it's not the time killer, the time waster, the, the man, those are derogatory terms. I shouldn't use those kind of terms, but I mean, it's not as sticky as, as Facebook. Is that a nice way to put it? <laughs> you know? Yeah. But so, so we have found by far a lot better success in using it as a tool to identify as a tool to start a conversation, but again, taking the conversation outside of, of LinkedIn has been much, much more successful for us. Um, say hello to Shannon. Scott Riches sends his greetings, says uh, two of my favorites, Doug and Hugh. Well, Scott um, lives across the street from me and I see him about once a blue moon. So hi, Scott. 
<laughs> he's on the webinar. He's on the webinar. He, he came over to the participant side. So Scott, you can ask questions or go in the chat chat box as well. Um, or just come across the street when, uh, when we're mowing lawns and we'll say hi. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, yeah, you never know. It's, it's interesting, um, Doug, I'll be speaking to a group and they'll, they'll point to me and say, well, as you said on your podcast, so it's, it's interesting, you, you were talking about how we influence people. It's really interesting um, how we impact other people with our thoughts and our comments and how it either connects with people or it doesn't. Right. And we can, we can have negative impact or positive impact on our, on our social media. So well, and again, that, that's another great point I want to kind of shove home in this LinkedIn conversation is, you know, if you spend, uh, you know, Hugh, Hugh and I are part of a, of a group that uh, kind of a training connecting group kind of thing that I, I go to every month and, and uh, sometimes I go to national things a few times a year and those kind of things. If you are really dogged, you might meet 10 people a day. And I mean, you have to really be at it. And the chances of one of those 10 people being the right person is, you know, whatever the chances are. You can literally do 10 times that in, a, in an hour on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, just the, you know, just the odds of connecting with the right kind of people uh, you know, you can put it in, in hyperdrive and then, you know, still take those, you know, kind of pre-qualified <laughs> leads back into, you know, how you would connect otherwise and connect outside of LinkedIn. But, but, you know, you can use it as a, as a huge filter, you know, you can, you can filter through hundreds of people instead of the people that you can run into at a, at a social event. Yeah. Some of the people that I know that, um, I referred to you and you've started working with, um, say they're amazed at the number of people that want to talk to them. Yeah. So you've done a really good job of helping them present themselves in a way that people want to talk to them. Um, those of us in say, uh, doing sales think it, uh, call them leads. Um, but we're always, if, if we're running a charity, I like the charity because nonprofit is such a stupid word. If we're running a charity, but that's the name of this thing, um, nonprofit chat. If we're running uh, a nonprofit, we should focus on profit, but we should focus always on cultivating relationships, maintaining the existing relationships, and continuing to build new relationships. Now, let me let me contrast the the brand slaughter thing that I mentioned earlier. Um, we can do anything we want, say anything we want as leaders, but there's negative impact to some of that. You can say all kind of bad words, but if you're in the wrong setting. That's a negative. You can post um, things that aren't normal, like somebody we know that's in Washington tweets <laughs> things that get in the news. That's not necessarily good for those of us running a charity. So what are things that we should not do on LinkedIn that have negative impact for us? Well, uh, right off the top of my head, and I've seen this happen a couple of times. In fact, uh, one of our mutual friends really kind of blew his entire social network apart by taking a political stand. Oh, so, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. He, told me, he told me he lost half his following overnight. Yeah. Um, so that's a, that's a good example of what not to do. You know, uh, we can be Jews or Mormons or atheists or Muslims, uh, but that's not relevant to our business situation. We can be Republicans. We can be Democrats. We can be anarchists. We can be... Bernie's boys, you know, we can be anything we want to be. It's not relevant uh, to your business setting. And so keeping those kinds of things as far away from your, of your social, uh, you know, and again, that's very different than what people kind of do in, in a lot of social networking settings. You know, I mean, people have Twitter followings kind of based on, you know, big Twitter followings are almost always based on a, uh, you know, a, a distinct and a niche point of view. Uh, your Facebook friends are probably down with you on some sort of niche point of view. That's not relevant to business. And so uh, what not to do? Don't do it. You know, I mean, talk about your benefits uh, in terms of what you can bring to someone in business and keep your, your political views, your religious views, your sexist views, your whatever kind of, you know, your gun view. I mean, I don't care what it is. It's not relevant to your business, and 
you've got to realize that every time you express a view like that, you're going to alienate some huge portion of your potential contacts. You know, if you're a Trump guy and you, you spout Trump, you've now limited yourself to 38% of the people on in, you know, in the United States. If you're a gun guy and you spout guns, you know, you've eliminated half the people. If you're an anti-gun guy and you spout anti-gun stuff, you've eliminated half the people. So there's also, Russ, Russ spent some time uh, working for the IRS and there's some pretty strict guidelines unless they get changed under Trump, mentioning Trump, um, that you really can't take a political position as a, as a 501c3 because you can lose your tax exemption. So. And again, I'm not really talking about just your, your, you know, again, I'm talking really more about, about your posts on LinkedIn and your profile on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, just in terms of inviting people to connect with you, you want to be as specific as you can be in terms of your benefits, what you can do for people, and you want to be as obtuse as possible about uh, whatever your views are, realizing that whatever your your most heartfelt view is, uh, that's going to probably alienate half the people that you could potentially connect with if you express that, no matter how dear it is to you. I guess unless you're selling guns, maybe, I don't know, but, okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> but I hope the point's understood. Oh yeah. The point's well understood. I want to, I mean, I'm being facetious to some extent, but I, I think no, you're not, you're not, it's a serious topic and we don't take it seriously. Um, I want to get to some tactical questions about identifying and connecting and messaging, but before I, and then I want to talk about this awesome infographic and tell people they can go to the website and download it. But I want to see if Russell has come up with a really hard question for you. I want to see you sweat. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, he's, 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 I'm, I'm, you know, uh, people found when I worked for the IRS that I was not nearly s as scary as people wanted to make me out to be. <laughs> I want to but, see in this Colombo sure. coat that you, you <laughs> had. This, he, he took a Colombo position and asking dumb questions, and I could p picture him in that trench coat. <laughs> <laughs> it really worked well. It worked best on $500 an hour attorneys, but that's a whole nother story for offline. But <laughs> it, in terms of, of really getting connected with people on LinkedIn and, and creating a message, uh, when I started, there were people out there that I, I just didn't know. I just started looking for people in in certain niches and, and just kind of went out there. Now, that was a little scattershot. And I actually got somebody to help do that. And I learned the concepts of going into groups and engaging. And uh, now I'm finding myself in a lot of groups. So uh, how would you parse out your, your engagement on LinkedIn? How would you actually, if, you know, I, I've got probably 40 different groups. So how would you go about dividing that and conquering it? Because uh, well, it's almost too much of a good thing in some ways. It's hard to be engaged in that many places. So how would you go about segmenting that? And, yeah, so I'm not a big fan of groups. Uh, maybe one or two groups if they're really specific to your niche and what you're doing. But, um, but let's, for example, take the idea that you're trying to find some directors uh, for your nonprofit you know, a, a group is not going to help you there at all. And, and like you say, it creates some noise that, that you maybe don't need to deal with. Uh, so I would unjoin every group that I was in, if I were you, that, that wasn't specific to what you're trying to accomplish today. Um, in terms of, of your old connections, uh, one of the other things that I, I am pretty careful about and ask our guys to be pretty careful about is not to mix um, – you know, one of the things that, that a lot of people do when they start out on LinkedIn is they import their address book out of their, you know, and LinkedIn encourages you to do that, to, to import their address book out of their, uh, out of their mail processor or their whatever it happens to be. And, and of course, that gets, gets you uh, mom and, and uh, sisters and uh, nieces and aunts and uncles and um, neighbor down the street or, you know, <laughs> all sorts of stuff that's kind of irrelevant. So you probably can't do anything about that if you've done that already, but don't do it anymore. <laughs> don't do it anymore. There's too much other stuff in there. I haven't done that because there's too many that just don't belong. 
Yeah. So, so, so the, the challenge is, is for people that have kind of more than one business. And that's a little tough because you kind of mix stuff up, but, but I think most of us have really one business and one thing we're trying to accomplish. And so, uh, you know, when you get a LinkedIn request from someone, unless it's someone that, that you think is really someone that you would have sought out, you know, don't accept it. Uh, you, there is a limit to how many LinkedIn connections you can have and it's, it's 30,000 right now. So that may sound like a lot, but I went past that a long time ago. So, you know, it's not a lot. And so, uh, you know, over the course of a, of a couple of years of using LinkedIn, you can easily suck up that many. So be selective about who you contact and make sure there are people that, you know, that, that fit your criteria. Um, you know, after that they can follow you and that's when, you know, your strategy of, of, of doing, you know, posting and those kind of things kind of comes more into play. But, um, you know, 30,000 contacts is enough to make a lifetime out of. So use them, use them carefully and use them wisely. Um, you know, I heard a little saying the other day that I'll pass on and, and that is that your net worth is now your network. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So your, your net worth is your network. So uh, use it carefully. Uh, don't just accept people for whatever. And, and there's a little code you're going to see uh, in, in, in LinkedIn every now and then. It's L-I-O-N. And uh, people will put that in their profile and stay away from those pr people. Now, th unless you're just barely starting out, but an L-I-O-N is a LinkedIn open networker. Uh, and that's not a bad thing, but I'm just saying that those are the people that, that uh, will connect with anybody and just the idea that they're trying to make a huge network and, and no selectivity or anything like that. So, so if people have L-I-O-N in their profile, you're going to probably want to stay away from them. Not that that's, they're bad people, but I mean, it's just the kind of thing that it's not specific and you only have 30,000 of them. And like I say, it, Russell, you're sitting there at, mm -hmm. at 3,500 and Hugh, as I remember you're at five or 6,000, you know, 30,000 may seem like a long ways away. It's not, you know, so, so make sure you use them carefully and, um, you know, maybe someday LinkedIn will open that back up a little bit more or whatever, but yeah. Wow. wow. I didn't realize that. I wonder if there was a cap. Let's, uh, before I go to the tactical questions, um, let's talk about the kinds of relationships we want to cultivate. I can see that <clears throat> we could create a peer to peer group with other nonprofit directors that are having some of the same problems that would be sort of a support group, maybe a mastermind kind of connection. I can see that we could connect with business people geographically that could be candidates for our boards. I could see that we could connect with marketing people in companies to start talking about how it would benefit their brand to be a sponsor for our nonprofit. Um, you got any comments on those or are there some other kinds of connections people might want to cultivate? You know, you might go directly for people that share your interest, you, you know, whatever the interest is of your nonprofit. Uh, you know, if you're in Kitty Rescue, and I, I hate to, you know, use a stupid <laughs> name like that, but I mean, you know, out of a half a billion people, you can find somebody that you can find a lot of people that share your specific interest. And uh, that's one of the things that you can do. And, you know, if it's macrame that's your, your interest, you're going to find thousands of people that love macrame or whatever it is. So, so if you're doing uh, great work in a niche, then you probably want to connect with other people that are interested in that niche um, and see where it goes. You know, some of them might be donors, some of them might be, uh, you know, might be business partners, they might be board members, they might be any number of things. They might be people that, you know, so long as somebody shares your interest, uh, that's a great place to start. And it's hard to, I mean, it'd be hard to name another place that gives you a search criteria or a way to search for people that, that share whatever esoteric interest you might have. You can find a list of people that on LinkedIn that, that, you know, self-classify as sharing that interest. That's a good segue. We got about a quarter of our interview left here. We try to keep these around an hour. Um, so how do we, um, identify those connections and then how do we contact them and then how do we use the messaging piece to stay in touch with them and at some point should I share the infographic would that be helpful 
Well, there's a bunch of questions there. So let's, let's talk about them one at a time. And uh, if we only have uh, 10 minutes left. Or whatever. We'll, we'll, we'll go until you stop talking. Let's, we'll go until you stop talking. Let's go fairly quick. But, and, and there's really not a lot of reason to go over that infographic because they can, you know, anybody that wants to can get, download it and go over it. So okay. let's just put it up and let's just talk about it in the barest of details like a minute or two. Okay. And then we'll kind of uh, go with your other your other stuff. So there's a there's a downloadable brilliant infographic and uh, for people watching on the web because we lost the Facebook connection for some reason bandwidth or something. But um, I'll I'll have this in the video. So we want to highlight some things here and people can download this. All right, I'm I'm going to quit just at this screenshot. This thing is uh, about five times as as tall as it is wide. So you're only seeing a little portion of it. But this first portion here, um, it's got some important things in it. First of all, now, Russell you used to pay for that background image. And now that everybody gets that for free. So you can put a background picture in your in your profile. You need to put a good business picture in your profile. Uh, the the it's just astounding. People are four times as likely to connect with someone that has an image as someone that doesn't have an image. Mm -hmm. And then the um, the headline, that's kind of the most important thing. This one is, I help B2B companies save money through outsourcing solutions. Just a silly uh, example. But the important things are there, you've identified who you help and how you help them. And that's the important part of the headline is, is who you help and how you help them. That will let people uh, kind of self-qualify as to whether or not they connect with you and whether or not you want to connect with them. If, uh, if people know what you do and who you do it for and want to connect with you, then you're, you're kind of halfway home right now. They, they already know what you're about. And if they want to connect with you after they know what you're about, then you know that, you know, you've got, you've got at least a start. Uh, you know, if you say you're account, an accountant, you might get other people that want to connect with you because they want to be part of the brotherhood of accountancy or whatever, but you know, that's a long way from having someone that would want to do business with your nonprofit. Um, I'm just going to leave it at that and let everybody kind of go through that download themselves. And on the website, there's also uh, a whole uh, post about doing headlines and about how important that is. I, I can't think of anything more important uh, than, than your headline. And it, you know, there's a place that calls them snaps. Um, but w whatever you call a, a headline, an elevator pitch, whatever it is, you should be able to communicate what you do, who you do it for, and what they get out of it in a few words. Uh, and, and you should put that as a bumper sticker on your business card, tattooed on your forehead, whatever. But I mean, they might be the most important 10 or 12 words you ever come up with in your life. And anyway, for, for lots of different things, not just for your your LinkedIn profile, obviously, but um, feel free to download that infographic and, and play with it. And then that website has a few more little pieces that might be helpful to you. I'm, I'm not it's an of... interesting names. S Z E A K. How do you say that? Seek. Seek.com. And uh, there's a, there's a, there's a piece after that for the profile and the infographic, and it'll be in the show notes for the uh, podcast and for the, the video. So what does that mean? Anything Zeke? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, so hey, hey, it's a it's a five letter domain. <laughs> give us some it's give us some kind of thing. Give us some tips on how to find people. I mean, you. So the there's tools inside of LinkedIn, and and Russell, I think you were probably making a, a reference to this also. But if you're going to get serious about LinkedIn, uh, you need to kind of pay for one of their their premium programs, which is called Sales Navigator. Uh, or they may have changed the name on it now just to sales, but it's a premium program inside of LinkedIn. Uh, it's like 80 bucks a month. Um, you can do most of the same stuff without paying for that, but LinkedIn will throttle you down. So LinkedIn will only let you do so many contact requests. And I don't really know what the number is, but it's probably, you know, on the order of a couple of hundred a month. Uh, whereas mm -hmm. if you use the, if you, you know, if you pay them, uh, you know, if you give them money, they're, they're more than willing to let you do kind of almost as much as you want within some reason. But um, 
uh, you know, th this isn't the time and it's not graphical enough for me to really teach you how to do that right now. But there's lots of good tutorials on LinkedIn about about searching. And there's there's actually 24 criteria in uh, Sales Navigator that you can search on. And, and one of them is a Boolean search, which means that you can you can use plus, minus, words, quote, marks, all those kind of things. So, you know, you really can do a lot more than just the 24 things. The 24 things are things like geography and job title and number of employees and those kind of things, which are all great. But uh, then you can add a Boolean search to that. So, like I say, if, if Kitty Rescue is your thing, you can find thousands and thousands of people that have Kitty Rescue in their profile. So, uh, <laughs> I, again, I'm not trying to be flippant, but just the point is, it doesn't matter what your niche is. You can use LinkedIn searching to identify other people that have that same interest. That is a powerful tool. And it's we, unbelievable, really and truly it is. It is a powerful tool. I, I um, got that navigator, sales navigator for a little while and I just couldn't figure it out. So I stopped it. So I'm like, hmm, I got to go back and, and find some tutorials. So if I heard you right, there are tutorials on LinkedIn on how to do this? Yeah, there are. And we occasionally run uh, webinars too. So uh, you can put my email address in the, in the chat if you want also. It's doug at seek.com. And um, reach out to me and I'll let you know next time we're having a webinar about, you know, kind of the more hands-on use of the, of the tools there. But, um, you know, just through the search functions in regular LinkedIn, you can start to get a feel for it because there's, I think there's a half a dozen search criteria that you get for free and you get an idea of what that search starts to look like. And by the way, Sales Navigator is free for a month. So if you want to just hop in and, you know, if you're, if you're getting semi-serious about it, then they make you put your credit card in and you have to remember to cancel or else they will hit you. But um, you can you know, you can get in there and play with it for free and start looking at, at uh, what it looks like. So the number one thing is to fix your profile and make sure that, that you've got your profile in a way, you know, starting with your headline and then the rest of your profile that lets people self-qualify. So, you know, if, if Kitty rescues your thing, put it right in there. I help rescue kitties to, I, I, I'll shut up now, but you get the idea. But uh, but that works to help people self-qualify. So about half of the people that you send a request to that do connect with you will just say yes, but the other half will go look at your profile. So that turns that profile into a really important thing. So I mean, you can get thousands of people looking at your profile. You know, start thinking about what that would cost you in terms of pay-per-click if you were in that kind of business. So So make that profile an engagement piece and realize that that literally about you know one out of one out of three people that you send an invitation to, first of all, you qualified who they are, so you have got a good idea they're inter you know they're the right kind of people. Now a third of those people are going to come look at your profile page, and you know half of those people connect with you and half of them won't. But I mean, at any rate, <laughs> you know you could be paying ten dollars a click in a lot of niches for people to come to your page, and you can get that, you know for a lot less money, even paying the $85 a month to LinkedIn. That's so quite a, that's quite head, amazing. Yeah. Headline profile, then the search thing, figure out the search thing, either, you know, one way or the other, you can find some, uh, some help on that. It's fairly self and, you know, self-evident sending your requests. So let me talk about that. Lost your audio. Something just went click. How's that? That's it. I just leaned against my mute button. How about that? Uh, so contact requests. So the, uh, what we found the best contact request is, is a very generic one. So once you identify a prospect, you send them out something that just says, Hey, I see we, Oh, first I need to back up again. Sorry. You can only do these contact requests to second level connections. In other words, I know Hugh and Hugh knows Russell, so I can, I can send Russell uh, a contact request. So from that point of view, it does make a lot of sense to have thousands of, of you know, potential people because every time I connect with someone like Hugh that's in the right business, I get access to his hundreds or thousands of contacts that hopefully a lot of those people are in the right business, not just his grandma and his aunt and his 
whatever it happens to be. So um, you can send out those, the request to second level people. So the wording that we use for, for those things is really generic. We say something like, uh, we call them by name, hey Hugh, uh, or hey Russell in this case. Um, uh, we both know Hugh or we have some mutual friends and I see that we're both interested in, in kitty rescue. Uh, would you be interested in connecting with me on LinkedIn? So we don't say we're selling them something. We don't say we're looking for a board member. We don't say we're looking for volunteers. We don't, you know, we just say, hey, we have some mutual connections. Um, we have some mutual interests. Would you like to connect? So that's where it starts from. And you're going to find that about 40% of the people that you send that request to will connect with you. So if you can get yourself in the habit of doing 100 a week, that's 40 new people. It's a lot of new people that you connect with every week uh, that, that now are qualified. They're not just, you know, random people or, you know, whatever. You've searched for them by a criteria. You've invited them based on a criteria. Most of them have come and looked at your profile page. So they kind of know what you're all about before they, they connect with you. So, you know, just right there, you know, you're halfway home, <laughs> at least halfway home. You know, you've got people that know who you are, why you've asked them to connect, and you know you already pre-qualified them with the search to get them in the right spot so we send out that little thing we follow it up with just a uh, a next message that's very generic that says hey thanks for connecting with me look forward to staying in touch just that simple just so there's an acknowledgement uh that they've connected and and then you know you just say hey um i'd like to know more about what you do uh, do you mind if we connect outside of linkedin and then you know, you can download your lists of people from your contacts. You can download their phone number. You can, you know, you, you have these people at this point. You have their phone number. You have their email address, you know, where they work, you know, what their job title is. And then you can go through there and then whatever your connection funnel is. You know, I mean, from that point, you know, there's a, from that point on, you know, there's a whole different conversation. That is how do you take people from contacts and leads into, you know, customers and, that's a, a different topic for a different day. But this is the start of your sales funnel or contact funnel or however you want to phrase it. You know, you can get, you know, just with a couple hours a day, really with a couple hours a week, you could be adding 40 or 50 people a week to your, you know, to the top end of your contact list. And now you have to have a way to, to deal with those people. You know, I mean, that's a lot of people and you have to have something to do with them and a way to take them from point A to point Z, so to speak. And again, that's a different, you know, topic for a different day, but in terms of making connections and finding who you should be connecting with, there's nothing like LinkedIn. Well, and, and um, the Meyer foundation did some research and found that 45% of nonprofit uh, executive directors are facing burnout. 75% are looking at the door out. And it would, it would occur to me as you were talking, finding people with common interest, you can find people who are retired and looking for something meaningful to do who could be part of your solution. They can sure. help you manage your social media. They can help take things off your plate. So I think putting on your schedule, your weekly schedule, some time to grow your sphere of influence on LinkedIn might be a good way to get your head around how to get out of this, this dungeon of being burned out and having too much to do find some champions and ask them, you know, let them help you. That's the thing that I would caution everybody on, on this is, is not to be uh, too general and to jump ship too many times. In other words, you need to, you need to know what you want mm -hmm. and, and have a way to get it. So, I mean, if you get into LinkedIn and say, I want to find, uh, you know, I want to find an executive committee of, of 14 people that live within a hundred miles, go do that. You know, I mean, because that's going to be a different kind of conversation and a different kind of profile than if you're going to say, hey, I want to ta tap into other nonprofits that, that contribute in my niche and I want to find those people. You know, you're going to do something different. So don't try and do everything at the same time. You know, hey, and that's just a, that's just a general focus thing. And um, it, <laughs> my wife and I have a running joke. So we've got grandkids and, and a few years ago we watched the cartoon movie Up. And do you know where I'm going with this? I don't know if you've ever seen it, but in Up, they have a talking dog, and the dogs talk to each other. And uh, in the middle of the conversation, the, the dogs turn their head and say, squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
The dog's yeah. an entrepreneur, right? Squirrel, <laughs> squirrel. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's a running joke around our house and one that you can kind of take home with you. And that is don't get squirreled. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you know, have one thing you want to do, do it till it's done and then move on to the next thing. And that's especially, you know, it's true with everything, including LinkedIn. So, you know, if you go, Hey, I need 20 kind of things and I'm going to go find 20 kinds of people on LinkedIn, you'll get exactly zero done. If you say, I want this one thing and I'm going to go find that kind of person. And then once I've got that done, I'll go do something else. That'll work. If halfway through you go squirrel, like I do half the time, <laughs> just don't do squirrel. <laughs> don't get squirreled. Be focused. Well, that's a good closing squirrel. point. That's good, that's good general advice. But as far as what you're saying here, that's very prudent advice. And one of the reasons we might be burned out is because we're doing the squirrel thing too much. Doug Brown, um, owner and manager of Newswire, which is a brilliant PR platform to get your releases out there. And then this, this, this whole track with LinkedIn, you've given us amazingly useful information. The uh, show notes will be transcribed. It'll be in the, uh, the podcast platform and there'll be the link will be immediately available tonight on nonprofitchat.org. The link for your, your, your email, for your website with newswire.net and for the, uh, the infographic, which is really useful. And then Doug, if, if you do a webinar, let me send it to the group of people that, that follow us here. So next time you do a webinar on the specifics, um, give me a script and I'll send it out to the people that have followed us and want information about what's going on. Be happy to do that. And thanks for the chance to, to talk. You know, everybody loves the sound of their own voice. So uh, thank you. I want to make you listen to it. <laughs> well, uh, I don't love it. I don't love it that much. <laughs> thank you so well, much. I, I, I just had somebody ask me about broadcasts. I mean, I do this. I do nonprofit culture success broadcast, which is going to become more frequent in August. But they asked me if I watch my podcast. So I said no, and they said you probably should start. <laughs> You know, watch, watch what you do and see what you're doing and you see how to make it better. Right. Hey, Amen. Last, last time somebody told me, Hugh, you ought to be on television. I got really proud and huffed up. I said, really? Why? They said, then we could turn you off. <laughs> we get it out. Thank you for this newsy broadcast, Doug. Thank you so much for us for co-hosting with me. Thanks for having me guys.